This is our moment to evaluate our perspective as it relates to being black, black at the table. And there are many tables for us to think about, tables that would create imagery that would last through eternity. With me, Kevin Hooks, my host, and tonight we've got the famous, those who have an idea on what it is to create imagery. This is gonna be a wonderful discussion, but if nothing else, have your mind open and be prepared to put something new inside so that you could share with a friend that you've met some female geniuses. Yes, I said geniuses. Those who have dedicated their lives to the imagery <laughs> of us, the imagery of blackness, the imagery of preserving and giving a real discussion and intellectual persuasion. So you won't have to just think of good times when you think of blackness. All right, so with me, I have Miss Rogers and Miss Burton. How are you ladies? All right. All right. Fine, Thanks thank you. Us. Well, I think it's important, uh, but I have no idea what it is to be in the film studies department. So uh, why don't you give us an idea of how the two of you came to be collaborators and then allow us to understand what is missing, why it's important, and for those who need to be able to advocate for more seats at the table in the area that you two specialize in. Nazinga, you wanna start? <laughs> sure. Um, well, we're in the Department of Film and Media Studies at Emory University. Um, film and Media Studies is really uh, a critical analysis of uh, film and media, not only as an art form um, and as uh, content, as you uh, described it earlier, but also um, looking at it through a variety of lenses, whether it's historical, it can be psychoanalytical, uh, it can be through uh, the lens of race, class, gender, sexuality, which is more of a cultural studies type of approach. Um, and things of that nature. So at Emory, um, sometimes you have like a film school that focuses on production, and sometimes you have a film school that focuses on, um, um, you know, the more critical uh, studies and critical analyses. At Emory, um, we're fortunate enough to have both of those uh, kinds of tropes represented in our department. Uh, and so we study, um, you know, the history, the theory, the cultural, the cultural studies, the critical analysis uh, behind uh, these industries and uh, the images and things of that nature um, and the context in which they are created, you know, when we talk about society and what have you, what's going on in terms of history. Uh, for example, John Lewis today, the documentary Good Trouble, this would be like a great opportunity um, to be discussing that in the classroom. And then we also talk about production, production values, how to bring those kinds of uh, that kind of information that you have, um, you know, that course content into your work. Um, and then the different types of genres and, and, and what have you that exist in uh, auteurs like Adeanza uh, Rogers, who's a filmmaker, an outstanding filmmaker, um, you know, how you leave your imprint uh, on a particular film. How do I watch that film and know that it is a Adeanza Rogers film? So uh, there's a lot that is, is talked about. And there's, of course, new media as well um, in these kinds of departments. And production, you take all that analysis and break that down, and then you'd figure out how to take that information and create the visuals for it, right? Filmmaking is a visual medium. So you're taking these ideas that you learn in theory and analysis, and you're turning them into the visuals to tell a story. And it's important to think about how the world works, think about the culture, think about, you know, the things that different cultures go through, the things that we want to change the world. You take all that stuff and you make a story. Now the question is, are you telling a story truthfully? And are you telling a story that reinforces stereotypes, right? So that's part of the production um, that you do. You teach students how to tell stories without regurgitating those stereotypes, without creating those tropes, without making Black people look a certain type. Because it's not just Black folks who are making these movies about us, right? There are white people who are making movies about us and telling our stories. So it's important that we teach them as well as we teach ourselves how to talk about Black people, how to tell stories about Black people. That's my long pause. I, you know, I like to get long pause. And, you know, in my dialogue, you know, I'm watching, I was sitting here trying to get cast right quick. I was kind of giving you the, you know, <laughs> <laughs> ready for this face in one of her films uh, absolutely <laughs> I'm like she needs his face right quick you know um, yeah yeah so you know it's interesting you were talking about how to 
how to produce quality content and avoid some of the typical challenges that we face historically in the film and television industry. I was curious about your thoughts. I heard Viola Davis recently say that um, she regretted doing the help. Um, and I'm very curious about your response to that. Like, you know, it's, you know, so looking back on some of the projects that we've had, you know, while it made them very successful actors, but at the same time, people looking back on the content being challenged by it. Yeah, I think we forget that people um, who act are, that's their job, right? right? And part of that job is, I'm gonna get money so I can buy a new house. It's not just <laughs> about the work all the time, right? And sometimes you make poor decisions in terms of the work that you align yourself with. There are things that I've worked on and I thought, why am I here? Like, I don't even believe in what's happening in this story. People aren't being treated well, but again, I gotta pay my rent. So I'm compromising myself in right, order right. to take care of myself as a human being. But then you look at the art that you're aligning yourself with and you think, is this really what I want to represent me? And that's a huge question you have to ask yourself as a filmmaker because you have to make decisions about who you work with. And then you think, is this person thinking about the world the same way that I'm thinking about the world? Are they reinforcing some ideas about blackness that I agree with? And you just, you know, and you learn more as you get older, right? You learn more about what it means to be black. I mean, what I knew as a, you know, a, a college student in grad school is completely different, not completely, but there are some things where those ideas are now shifted and changed a bit because I have learned, I've grown. So I can see her totally feeling that way. I think a lot of filmmakers at a certain point think, oh my God, this is a movie I don't want people to see but right. people are gonna see it and you have to be able to have a conversation about it. Yeah, and to your yeah. point, I spoke to Sam Jackson about Snakes on a Plane and all he said <laughs> to me was, I said to them, are you gonna meet my quote and pay my money? And if right. you are, I'm there. And so he's, you know, going on to be the largest grossing, highest grossing, you know, actor in Hollywood history. Uh, Miss Burton, we talked about what's, you know, about actors in front of the lens. What about the challenges for actors face or talent faces behind the lens? Yeah, so um, so it's Dr. Burton, not to be that person, but I just got to oh, let you know that because I do have a PhD. Hey, um, <laughs> doctor, hey, listen, if I have one, and I you feel like I'm too old. Any other way. <laughs> I feel like I'm too old to be a miss. That's, a, that's the only thing behind it. That's the only thing behind it. That's it. That's it. So you call me the singer or you call me Dr. Burton, but you do right, not call Burton. me miss. You're right. You're right. I owe you that one. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, I was like, do I say something? Do I not say something? Okay, so this uh, to go back to this. We do it. We're in the say something category right <laughs> now. <laughs> it's a truth telling business right here. Okay, okay. Call me out every time. I'm wrong. <laughs> so um no, I, I mean I think that um they, you know, hit the nail on the head. It's like, as you know more, uh, you do better. And, you know, the uh, what's interesting about the choices and what Viola Davis said and some other actors have said about regrets, um, uh, about movies that they've made or how they allowed themselves to be treated or, you know, things they were talked into, is ultimately it, it might be that film that gets them to the next film that gets them to the next film where they do some incredible work, right? So, for example, Jordan Peele, I always use him as a big example. Like, if you were looking at Jordan Peele's earlier work, where he was kind of like, you know, he's, a, he's part of a comedy, comedic team. He works mostly in television. He's that funny guy. They made that movie about cats. Like, that was funny. <laughs> it was funny. It was funny. It was funny. It's like a great movie to have a cocktail and watch this movie, right? It's, it's fun. It's fun. Um, but if you watch that film and you thought that's all that Jordan Peele could do, then right. you probably have an argument like, eh. But if he hadn't done that work, you know, that comedy space, worked in that comedy space and gotten that, kind of credibility on television and then was able to move into film. And he made that, that film, which I thought was funny, but you know, it's definitely not going to win any Oscars or heck, Rotten Tomatoes. I don't know. But um, ultimately it was him making those decisions and taking those steps that led him to get out, which was the movie that changed his career, really changed the landscape, landscape of black cinema as we define it in that moment. Um, and then has allowed him to make these other very important and significant contributions um you know uh, in film and so you know if someone is just all you know their whole career is one thing i think you can make the argument that they got some things they need to work out 
Um, but ultimately, if you do pay attention to people like Viola Davis and Jordan Peele and Will Smith and folks of that nature or who, who make it of that stature, even Denzel Washington made Carbon Copy, uh, which right. George Siegel like, and if you've seen that movie, that is, a, I mean, one of the most racist and vile movies I've ever seen in life. Um, but had he not made that film, he wouldn't have gotten the soldier story. Had he not gone to soldier story, he wouldn't have gotten to where he needed to be. You know, if he had not made a film with Spike Lee, he wouldn't have made these other incredible films with Spike Lee, which led him to other directors. Um, and so I don't think you can really judge people, you know, on a one by one or case by case basis. I think you can judge people based on the body of work. So I don't think people should really apologize for taking roles that they needed at whatever time that was or where they were in their career and where they were in their life. Um, I think ultimately it's like as you grow and as you get more power and resources and access, then it's, you're better able to judge, you know, based on what people do. And then, you know, you can't begrudge people. Sometimes they just want to have a good time. Sometimes they just want to make a, a movie. They don't want to do the heavy lifting. Um, they want to just get a check and, and go home or whatever. And you can't begrudge people that either. So I just think it's a slippery slope. So Dr. Burton, though, what do you what do you say to your students when they ask you questions about films like Django, for instance, and Chain? They say Jamie Foxx is a great incredible star, Kerry Washington mm -hmm. and Sam Jackson, but they're surrounded by all these white people using the N-word and and, and, and and you know, even though it's historical, you know, Quentin Tarantino is known for you know that type of work. What do you say to your students when they ask you questions about the viability of that work, how they can, you know, break into Hollywood and avoid that kind of work? Or if they, um, what, they love what I would say, they what I say to, yeah, no, I get it. What I say to my students is, um, I, I quote a, 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 a British scholar who is of Jamaican descent. Um, and um, oh gosh, I was about to uh, say his name, I had a brain fart, it's been a long day, a lot of stuff going on today, and he'll come to me. Um, but he talks about the three ways, they you know, what I'm talking about the three ways in Stuart Hall. Oh my gosh, I am tired. Um, but the three ways in which um, people uh, intersect or interact with media, and there are three ways: is the you know the dominant way or the preferred way, which really looks at the way that you know people who say, "Oh, it's just entertainment." What difference does it make? Then there's the negotiated way where it's like you can see all those problems with Django, right? You're like, "Oh my God, they got Kerry Washington, they've got." Uh, Jamie Foxx, uh, Samuel Jackson, all these people, but then it's Quentin Tarantino, who is, um, even though he's a, 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 a brilliant filmmaker in some respects, uh, mm -hmm. he's highly problematic in terms of um, his racism and sexism and misogyny and all of that. So that's a negotiated relationship. Like when you watch Pulp Fiction and you're like, oh my God, I can't stop watching this movie, it's incredible, but oh my God, why right. why they gotta treat Ben Grange this way? Why they gotta treat you know right. these women characters this way or whatever? That's that negotiated relationship. And then there's the oppositional where it's like, you know, Quentin Tarantino, you just said the N-word way too many times. I think you're overrated. I think you just watched a bunch of movies and you make the same movie over and over at this point. I'm mm -hmm. not dealing with you. I'm not watching it. I don't care who's in it. That's oppositional, right? Yeah. So when you talk to your students, you try to teach them the history you try to teach them the theory and then you try to teach them how to apply it. So you would be applying that critical theory to this particular film and being able to say that, you know, you know, I, I either it's just entertainment, you know, and this is, you know, these are three categories. And of course there's, there are things that are in between, but ultimately that's what you have to do. Um, and you have to choose what's most important to you, but what you can't do is talk about a film that you haven't seen. Amen. So when people are like, Oh, I just don't watch his films. Then you should stop writing your, medium essay immediately right. and just put the put the laptop to the side and go ahead and write about something that you actually know about and that you have seen and that you can actually talk about um but yeah you know we can have those kind of conversations i think it's, it's right and that's what's great about what we teach is that people do want to watch films they do want to watch uh, tv they do watch youtube and vimeo and all of these other uh contents and they're watching it on their phones and so it gives you the opportunity to have an actual conversation with them about what they're watching why they're watching it and to give them things to consider even if they don't agree with you and you don't agree with them right. you know some things are right and some things are wrong right but uh, ultimately in terms of how you decide or how you feel about the n-word you know all i can tell you is you can say it to yourself, to your friends if you want to, but I better not hear it. <laughs> not in my classroom. Right. Um, and well, you better not say it to me. <laughs> I right. mean, from a production standpoint, from in the background, right, when you have students who are writing scripts, is your character racist or are you racist? Like, there's yes. a difference between those things, right? There's a, you know, I, I am not a Tarantino fan because 
instances of the use of the N-word constantly. And I remember reading an article where he said um, his stepfather was Black. Like that gives him some kind of right, right, right. So, like, so right. you know, card to say, oh, I can say the N word. No, you can't, bro. Like, that's not <laughs> that's not what we're talking about right here. But that that's what we have to talk about in terms of the people creating the media, because Nazinga is talking about that, you know, that theory in, in terms of how we interact with the media. But someone has to create it. And yes. those who are creating it, what are their, you know, their worldviews? Again, mm -hmm. are you racist or to races. There is a complete difference in that. And we have those conversations in the classroom. We talk about misogyny as well and how we introduce women into our scripts and how we, you know, we introduce women based off the way they look, but we introduce men based off their character. That's two different mm -hmm. things. And mm -hmm. that, we have to have that conversation, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Roger, so there's, you see how I see what I did there, Professor? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about Quentin Tarantino as a director. There's a lot of a, 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 a swath of incredible black directors on the horizon. So we talk, and I think that they can affect change in this particular subject. Um, talk about some, can you talk about some up and coming directors that we should be keeping our eye on? Well, there are some genre directors that I'm really um, liking right now. There's Nick, um, Nikki Atu Jusu, who created a, a short film called um, Suicide by Sunlight, and it's Black vampires, right? It's like Black women in genre and horror. That's like a thing you don't see. So you have these Black filmmakers who are jumping out there, right? You have um, Numer um, Perrier, who did um, Jezebel, that talks about the sex industry in a very... Um, uh, a respect, respectful way. It talks about what women have to go through, and it's in the, you know that lens of womanhood, right? It's not sexual. It's not um, sensationalized. It's about mm -hmm. everyday life and how you have to be, or you've made this choice to be in the sex industry, and what does that mean to you as a young woman, right? So there are a number of young. Um, I can't remember her name right now, but she directed a film called Clemency, which mm -hmm. is a oh, yeah. strong, strong piece of um, a piece of work. And it, you know, we have a lot of Black women who are telling stories. Unfortunately, Hollywood has room for the same people over and over again. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear about people getting deals, and it's like wait, they just got a deal last week. And the mm -hmm. same person gets the deal over and over again. So they're not, um, Ava DuVernay said something about, you know, if I can't go through this door, I'm just gonna make a window, right? Mm -hmm. And she's, you know, made a space for herself, but she is also one of those people that get the same, you know, get the opportunities, opportunities over and over again. So you have people who are trying to come up, but Hollywood is like, mm, we got one already. We don't need another one. And before mm -hmm. she came out, it was like Tyler Perry was our one. Right, mm -hmm. we can't have multiple ones and we can't tell multiple stories, it seems. But we keep telling the same stories over and over again, right? Like we have a remake of this and a remake of that. And there are other stories that black filmmakers are telling, right? Mm -hmm. There are other stories that young black women are coming up and telling. Um, I can't think of names at the moment for some <laughs> reason, but there are a number of black women who are really, you mm -hmm. know, telling strong stories and I mean, they need to have the opportunity. That's what's missing. So before I turn this back over to my co-host, um, where can we see some of these films that you mentioned? Um, so you can see them online on Vimeo. Like you can do a search on Vimeo. Um, you can go to Sundance and you can see some of their work. Oh, Garrett Bradley is one of those filmmakers. She won, she was the first black person to win a, um, to win the documentary um, section of Sundance. So she's done some really beautiful work in terms of documentary and um, criminalization and the, the justice system and things like, and womanhood. Um, so you can go online and do a search for them. I'll send you some, y'all can link to these different people because they're doing some beautiful work. You know, people aren't paying attention and that's, that's the shame. There isn't a lack of talent, there is a lack of opportunity. Yeah. And I think you can also, um, you know, film festivals are always great places to see movies, of course. And because we're in uh, COVID, one of the good things about film festivals are that a lot of them are moving online. 
So um, now you don't have to buy expensive plane tickets and registrations and all that kind of stuff, but you just have to um, think like, oh, ABFF is coming up or, you know, um, Urban World is coming up or the Pan-African Film Festival is coming up or Afro Comic Con is coming up or Bronzelands Film Festival is coming up. And um, you can watch those films online. And of course, sometimes they'll have a little overlap, but a lot of times um, there are lots of different films because they have different um, areas of focus of, of what they're looking for. Um, so that's a great way to watch films as well. That's awesome. Muscle? Thanks, Kevin. Um, doctor? <laughs> I knew it. That's why I don't say it. Because people are going to be like, oh my God. <laughs> um, well, you know, just so you know, uh, um, you're not going to steal it from me. See, I, I, I like to have friends that have uh, doctor, see, I, I want to walk in the room. I want them to just believe she got natural hair and she don't have. A and then I got a doctor, you know. So, so don't play with me. I, I am all for it. I need our generations to want to be doctor. Uh, uh, so, you know, I think I, I tell people all the time. I'm not sure that telling people that a PhD was a hater player degree that that was. <laughs> <laughs> you may have studied the intellectual journey for two or three generations, you know, just because they didn't understand that uh, every university needs to have a few doctors in order to stay in business. And you know. So for me, it's not, I think the, the description and part of what I'm going to challenge you uh, both with is we are receipt shareholders of an industry that hates us. We are receipt shareholders of an industry um, that doesn't appreciate nor invest in us, but actually siphons off our capital and gives us the standard we have Negro pets. Because when I see the industry, it seems to be a little bit closer to petism. They clearly don't have the, more, the most doctors, particularly black doctors in the room. So we, we don't have that. So the study of us, is uh, remiss. And I'm having this discussion as it relates, um, Ms. Rogers, to culture. Like, like, not only are you giving me this one size of culture, you're giving me my worst side on most days. You're giving me my side that takes my self-esteem on the other day. And then the rest of the days, you're miseducating a whole generation and continue to do that time and time again, and then rewarding that person and then suffocating the very, and extinguishing for some, because they really don't believe that they can make it, their vision. So I think the absence of both the doctor in the room in education, the absence of a woman of color who can be honest with you about how you're misappropriating and totally abusing our culture through the lens, and even making us have people in the writing room when the story has nothing to do with you and you weren't even invited to the party, but in order to get it greenlit, the room has to be 75, 25, and it is in the, to our favor. So I think those are the seats at the table that I think we have to share and get Emory to study and actually put a, a, a number on that. Because I don't know that Viola was saying, I hate that I was in that movie. I think that she was more saying, I hate that you didn't know that this was bad and couldn't have rewritten this in a different way where you showed that it was bad and that all these women were bad. Because I think the worst part was the white women haven't said that it was bad. No, Bryce Howard has said that um, because it was trending on Netflix as like the number one movie because, you know, the world wants us to be in the servitude space, right? So she said, this is not the movie you guys should be watching right now. This is not the movie to watch when everything is happening in the world right now. So she's spoken up a bit. So, but you're right. I mean, there's a commodification of our trauma and there are people telling our story. Again, so everybody will get that. <laughs> there's a commodification of our trauma, right? Mm -hmm. They're making money off of how we feel and how we've been disrespected and how we're continually disrespected. And I know that, you know, you have people who are going to be telling the story of George Floyd, right? Are those people going to be, you know, are we going to tell that story or is it going to be told by someone else? I, and that's a good question. You have the Tiger Woods documentary that's coming out and there has been talk about the fact that it is made by two white men. Like where, where are the people in the background behind the camera who are also informing the lens, right? And that's missing. 
So we have, you know, we have people in the room who are telling the stories there. You can tell um, Watchmen. Watchmen had a very diverse writing room. They had women, they had black folk, they had people of color. And you can tell that that was a show that was written by a lot of different cultures and people with ideas. It wasn't written by a whole bunch of white boys sitting in a room. And you can tell when the dialogue of a film is also white people thinking that's how black people talk. So mm -hmm. you can you can see that when you're watching a film and you can see, oh, we're missing. We're missing behind the scenes. We may be in front of the camera, but we are missing in the in the beginning of the story. And that's really important to talk about as well. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, you know, you have to recognize that Hollywood is an industry that is that thrives on failure. The failure rate in Hollywood is tremendous. And so yet there's this convergence and this Dr. Burton, I'm gonna direct this to you. There's a convergence of art and business that we've always struggled with, right? So yes. how, how do you address that continual convergence? Well, I mean, I think Hollywood, you know, they have to wise up sometimes. And, you know, it is an industry, it's driven by bottom line. I think people forget that, you know, um, it's a culture industry, right? And it appropriates lots of different people's culture and tell stories around it. Um, and the question is who gets to tell the stories? Where are the films gonna be seen? Um, and how much money do they make back, right? So one of the ways in which you can vote with your dollars is based on you know the movies that you do see versus the movies that you don't see. And mm -hmm. Hollywood is not always right. So for example, um, you know one of the reasons that Hollywood is, is uh, struggling now is because they allowed the online market to explode. Um, and instead of shifting and doing things that the that the online market allowed people to do, like have actual the final edit on a film like Martin Scorsese went to Netflix because he couldn't get the final edits on his films which I think is crazy <laughs> but right. that is the case he said that's one of the reasons he went to Netflix because he can get the final edit on his films um, but you know when other companies like a Netflix and Hulu and, and all those other companies um, were doing different things and allowing people to create who were not traditionally uh, Hollywood folk right or maybe they did come up through the ranks of Hollywood um, but had some different types of stories they wanted to tell that they weren't going to be allowed to tell within the mainstream industry, gave them opportunity, gave them a shot or what have you. So, you know, we have these moments, you know, black exploitation, you know, uh, basically resuscitated uh, the film industry when it was, it was about to collapse, like out of the eighth, the eighth major studio, seven of them were about to go bankrupt. Um, but black exploitation, they found, you know, Melvin Van Peebles was working in film. Um, he's working outside of the system. He was making his own film. He was getting his own financing. He found, you know, Earth, Wind, and Fire did the soundtrack. Bill Cosby put some money in. Like, people pulled it together, $500,000 film, flipped it, and made $10 million, right? So they saw that business model. And that's how you started getting the introduction of these more um, diverse casts, which, of course, it went off a damn cliff. But initially, when you had Gordon Parks, and you have Richard Roundtree, and you have uh, Tamara Dobson, um, you know, when you have uh, people who are um, like really trained, um, um, Superfly, uh, Ron O'Neill, thank you, theater trained. Um, you know, you have these people, Moses Gunn, right? These are folks who are, are coming out of the Negro uh, Actors Ensemble. You have these filmmakers um, uh, and directors who um, are, you know, you know, not only great uh, filmmakers, but I mean, they're great photographers who now get the shot to make film, you know, the most moving image. But that wasn't going to happen <clears throat> unless someone like a Melvin Van Peebles had the success that he had. And so I say that to say that Hollywood is Hollywood, yes. Mm -hmm. But there are opportunities that do arise and times that do arise. And Hollywood has learned, and it, you know, maybe they haven't. It's like America. You know, we come around to the same point, you know, every 25 years. <laughs> but, you know, maybe they haven't learned. But if they don't get out of their own way, other things will happen. Other industries will spring up other genres will happen. And we will do what we always do, which is create our own media. So um, I think Hollywood has motivated now, um, not only because of the social climate uh, of the country, but also because of the people who are in the industry who have the power to now say how they really feel. Like Viola Davis, like 30 years ago, Viola Davis would have never been able to say, you know what, I, I didn't want to make that film and make another one. But now she can do that, right? And so as the power grows, um, then, then, then too will the industry shift and it will change. It'll be slow, but it's going to be short. So. Right. So, so Professor Rogers, uh, you know, I'm going to shift a little bit. One of the things that I'm uh, uh, intimately um, 
um, familiar with is nepotism in Hollywood. I worked in and out of Hollywood for two decades now. And I can tell you, Black folk are the greatest purveyors of nepotism in Hollywood. So you talk about Van, Van Peebles, you know, I can talk about, you know, Kevin Hooks and Robert Hooks, and they're good, for, I mean, he's my namesake and we're good friends. But at the same time, you know, if you're not a part of that clique inside of Hollywood, even the Black clique, it's hard to break in. So when you're talking to your students and people who want to get in, into the space, what do you say to them to combat that, recognizing that oftentimes the people that are the biggest challenge are the people who look like them? Well, I tell them the same thing I'm constantly telling myself, do the work. I love That's it. it. Yeah. Do the work. I mean, you got to do the work and so that you can't just complain about what's going on, right? If you're not doing the work and you're complaining, that's like complaining about politics, but not voting. Really? Right. You don't get a voice. You had right. a voice. You didn't use it. You don't get a voice. So it's kind of like that, right? It's like there is nepotism, but there, there also is this sense of, I can't remember what director said it, but it was a white director. And he said, you know, I'm going to hire the people that look like me or remind me of me. Mm -hmm. That means you're not going to hire any black people. So right. you do have this group of other black people who are, you know, you've created this space together and this is a safe space. Mm -hmm. And you you know, you, you want to bring people up and you do bring people up, right? I don't think it's always just, no, you, you can't come in because you're not going to play with us because we're going to, we got our own little thing going on. Right. That does happen. Yes. But I think also if you do the work, people will pull you in. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what's important. You got to constantly, and I'm, telling myself this all the time. You got to write that script. It's 12 o'clock at night. I got to write the script. I got to edit. It's two o'clock in the morning. I got to keep doing the work. Mm -hmm. And that's where you, and that's what I tell my students, you know, no one's going to give it to you uh, unless you, there is someone and your, your dad is in the industry. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I just contradicted myself. I was say, well, I was just saying, you might want to hear. <laughs> yeah, I just contradicted myself. But I mean, <laughs> There are people who still do the work and that's what's important. Um, that's the first step. And then you can say, how do I get in the door? If y'all, you know, got the door closed, you mm -hmm. know, again, you find a window, you make a door, you do whatever you need to do to get in there. And that's, you know, that's the work also. That's what you have to do. I, I like what you're saying, but I don't think it's true. I, I really think, and, and I'm obviously, I think what you're saying, Professor Rogers is true, but my, my uh, point is, I think economically we give people a pass. I really think our voice as it relates to measuring our dollars and what we invest in this industry and what is returned back to us is what we really have to focus on. Like we really need um, to talk about the redlining and the lack of investment that you're talking about. I think that's what um, we're seeing. We even see it when Netflix says, well, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna give this money to Morehouse and Spellman because they're feeling something. They they know something. They they've decided they're gonna make black product and they're gonna also be socially conscious. But I'm not certain. I haven't heard many in the industry talk about the dollar figure that these individuals, because we all go to see Iron Man, we all go to see Black Panther. It makes a billion dollars plus, 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 you could, we could Google it. Um, and then we don't say, well, what is the reciprocity for young filmmakers, Disney, now that we have given you a billion of our dollars? You know, if we don't consciously speak to our economic investment through being receipt shareholders, we're gonna continue to believe myths. And that's a myth. They're going to recognize you because you make it great. Well, time passed. You don't have the same time. And for our community, our economics, that, that's, that's the thing that I'm, I'm most concerned with as it relates to seat at the table. What are the real economics that are being siphoned out of my community? And then how are they being invested in somebody like you? Well, this how is they the institutional, you know, racism within the industry, right? Who is green lighting the projects? Who is the executive in the room? No, but see, my thing is more for the doctor. It's more on um, she and, and some of her academic friends that look at 
Hollywood's investment economically and then basing that based on our investment. Because unless you have the numbers and the data to talk about economic racism in an industry, they ignore the facts. Well, and so the numbers and the data, there's an initiative at the University of Southern California where they're actually tracking all of this information. Um, and uh, that you're talking about. So they're looking at everything from representation in front of, behind uh, of the screen, how much money films are making, uh, where they're making the markets that they're moving in. And all of this data is being compiled like every year. So you are correct. That is kind of data that we need to have access to. Um, but it's been fairly recent that it's been compiled um, in one particular place. So you've had scholars who've done this type of work. Uh, Ed Guerrero, for instance, looks uh, very much at um, you know, African-American uh, images and how they correlate to what was happening from an economic perspective in the industry at the time, as well as what's happening economically in society. Um, one of our colleagues, Beretta Smith-Shamade, looks at um, television. She you know, looks at TV. She's studied extensively uh, BET, um, Black Entertainment Television, and, and really looked at the ways in which, um, you know, that industry um, uh, it, it emerged around BET and its content and what it did in television um, and, rep you know, moving beyond what I call representation, because people always want to talk about, you know, uh, you know, how we're represented. And that's important, right? Whether they talk about behavioral characteristics or physical characteristics or whatever, that's important. But it's not everything. And so I agree with you, um, Munson, when you talk about um, having to get beyond that, right? How do we correlate all of this data we've been compiling? How do we correlate these, um, what we call causal relationships? Um, you know, between what uh, what people want to see and what gets made, right? Because that's the other thing that we got to talk about, which Black people don't like to talk about. But I'll say it. If you ask Black people right now, I don't know who's watching, just ask them, what kind of movies do you want to see? Uh -huh. And then they're going to tell you, oh, I want to see a period piece right, um, right. with Black people in Washington, yeah. D.C. Yeah. at Howard University, such and such or whatever. And Dayanza will go out and write that script and it'll be beautiful. And she'll go out and shoot that movie and spend five years of her life getting it made and nobody will go see it, right? right. right. But then if you put some other stuff in there, which I think there's room for everything. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think there's room for everything. Um, then people will flock to it. So what people say they want, Munson, and what they really want are two different things. So we've yeah. got to line that out. So when you talk about receipt investors, that's something you got to talk about too, um, uh, in terms of more what I'm saying, Doc. Is, is um, Disney rolled off five hundred million dollars on their vice investment? Five hundred million. Mm -hmm. Five hundred. They just wrote it off. They just said it's not coming back, y'all. Time for it to go. Five hundred million. So mm -hmm. if you just think about that. Five hundred million. It's 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 for me. It is the lack of investment. I don't want to talk about the conversation that everybody else is. Who's there? That's good. We can, we can, we've done that with the Atlanta airport. 30%, just give us a percentage. We get it. We can talk about that. That's compliance. I want to know about investment because the investment is where you get the time. Investment is where Ms. Rogers gets, or Emory, you're able to teach these students and say, you know what? We spend $10 million for the next five years, literally investing in films, and we get one big budget film of, you know, a half a billion dollars every two years. That's a different conversation. I'm with you. I want a big budget movie. I watched the um, Morgan Stanley just put on a investment in entertainment and why um, Hollywood bets on big films mainly. Yeah, they got it. It was very clear. They did a wonderful example. They also talked about superstar power and why it's not going to change. And, and the people that feed off it on the other end that, you know, make movies for 20 million and the 10 million. Um, I get it. But we gave to Black Panther a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. It's the backdrop of us having a $1.4 trillion buying power and we over index on ticket sales. So, I know. Look, you're preaching to the choir. Okay. I get it. I know exactly what you're saying. Preach. I know. But what I'm saying to you is, it is the Hollywood film industry that has been built on a foundation of systemic racism, like I mean, codified not only in front of the camera but behind the camera and what have you. So my opinion is, why even fool with Hollywood? Right. That's my opinion. 
right? It's yeah, like, okay, I, I have you have take, these folks. I spend my dollars spend, with you. I need, I need us to understand the consciousness. But why are you going to try to change an industry that has been, is over 100 years old and has proven time and time again that they are going to be wedded to the way that they, to their business model, elevating the stories that they think are most important, hiring the people that they think matter. Mm-hmm. And hopefully, you know, one day, all of a sudden, we're, they're going to recognize our value. They don't recognize our value in media. They don't recognize our value um, when we have to compete with, you know, the Burton Wire has to compete with <laughs> Rolling <laughs> Out, which has to compete with Black Press USA, which has to compete with The Root, which has to compete with, because, you know, in their mind, we're all the same publication. And it's like, no, we're not MTO. Rolling Out is trying to do something different, not to dis MTO. There's an argue, uh, audience for it, obviously, but that's a different audience. We're not all the same. We're not all monolithic or what have you. So my point is, instead of asking Hollywood to change, which, I mean, you can still make the ask. I get that. I would rather be like, okay, I'm going to give my money to Black students at Black film schools or at film schools. I'm going to give my money to or create a fund because you can do that, venture capital. Um, You know, people who have money, uh, uh, LeBron James has done it. I was like, yeah, it's 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 been a long day. But LeBron James has done it. But you can create venture capital funds, things of that nature to fund black films. People have done it before. So it's not something that hasn't been done. But what we have to do is decide, do we really want to give everything we have to Hollywood in order to get them to get them to give us back what, twenty percent? We're only twenty percent of the movie going audience, right? And if we think about international numbers, right? Um, but if you want to do that, that's fine. But don't be surprised when this industry that has shown us who they are over and over again continues to do that. That's all I'm saying. So yeah, you can say, listen, we're giving you this amount of money. This is what we expect back. We want to see our black directors. I want to see black camera people. I want to see black gaffers. I want to see black this, black that. What have you? I want the publicist to be black. I want all of these things to have uh, to happen, and I want it in more than one person at a time. Of course, we can say that. Of course, we can lie before that. Of course, we can say that. But why would we do that when we can actually create our own? So, well, Professor Professor Rogers, to Dr. Burns' point, we should be thinking outside of the system, and we and we have. It's called Tyler Parent. The problem is, is that I'm inundated with rumors of malfeasance, unpaid actors, poor writing, all the things that happen. I'm like, let's keep it real. So when we think outside the system, and we get a Tyler Perry, and all the complaints that come along with that, and I ain't, look, I ain't knocking the brother, no shame, get his money. But if I get rumors of people being unpaid, I'm forced to go back into the system. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, you do have, it's problematic. It's problematic, right? Like it's complicated. A, it, yeah, you have create an entanglement, huh? <laughs> we have an entanglement where you don't yes. have a writer's room. You have this man writing yes. every single script for every single episode of every single show. I'm not going to give my opinion about. Oh, the mine, you you mean? <laughs> oh they don't need. I'm not gonna give my. I mean, that alone tells you what I think. But I understand that we have to go outside of the system. Because the system constantly tells us, as Nzinga says, it will constantly show itself to us. Yeah. White men who are in these will get millions of dollars to make a movie that have about made, us. Yeah, that have made yeah. maybe a short film, a couple of short films, and maybe a low budget feature. I have a friend who's trying to shop a movie now, and they are saying we need to see proof that you can do this movie. Yeah, he shot other movies already. He's done commercials. He's done videos. Like he's done the work. And like I said, do the work. But he's, he's, you know, he's still trying to shop this idea. And all he's asking for is like 12 million. And I said to him, don't you think that's a lot? He's like, I'm asking for the same thing these white boys ask. What do you mean? Is that a lot? And there you go. He can't get that in the system. But you constantly have to push against the system. We, I mean, look, Tyler Perry is who, you know, he is. He's a great businessman. But where is the other time? We got Oprah. She's, you know, and LeBron have their own things going on. But what is the work that they're trying to create? You know, I'm not like, I'm not knocking the fact that you want to make, um, what's the the basketball movie with the cartoons? Oh, Space yeah. Jam. I'm not knocking that you're trying to do Space Jam again. I'm not, because I'll watch it. But it's like, there are some really interesting stories out there and we're not telling those stories. And I think that's where, 
we're failing ourselves, mm-hmm. right? Where we have, you know, the shows that we have aren't the best shows. We could do better. But where does that money come from? I don't know where that money comes from. I'm trying to find it myself. <laughs> I have no banks. idea where that Overseas money comes from. Overseas banks, that's where it comes from. Um, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, and I think that you can look at, um, if you look at over time, when black people have been most successful. Um, and I don't, I, I, and I think we have to think about how we measure success as well. Uh, so we might measure success as Black Panther being successful, but I think Ryan Coogler's Fruitvale Station was a ridiculous success and it was made independently, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and that's the thing that I want people to think about. Like if you support and invest in independent films, um, like the films of Ryan Coogler, like the films of Ava DuVernay before she blew up. Um, eventually, those folks will be able to, at this time, before it was much harder, but I think now, uh, because there's so much competition, there's more competition um, available. Um, they can get in there and they can do those big movies and then they can turn around and do a small movie and they can do a documentary like Ava. Ava just kind of does what she wants. I'm going to do a little TV. I'm going to do this documentary over here. Okay, I'm going to do this uh, um, historical uh, uh, film. I'm going to do this little science fiction over here. Um, and I think ultimately that's what you want for the artist, right? You want them to be able to make a decision. Like, do I want to be at Netflix or Hulu or, or whatever, one of these 12 billion streaming companies they have out here now, or do I want to work primarily in Hollywood? And knowing that, you know, um, that they can do either or. But I think with Hollywood, it's about more than just like dumping in 300 black people into the academy and saying, ooh, we have diversity. Or, okay, let's put this person in charge of diversity at this company, but then you don't empower them to make any real changes, right? right? Or to to convert the chat, because, you know, and that's what I mean when people think about Hollywood, because we are um, engaged with it, right? You know, it's it's our entertainment. You're right. We do invest in it. It's not only our money, it's our time. Like, time is money, right? And so you want to return on that. But it is an industry that is set up and has been set up. Uh, for many years. And it, even though people talk about disruption, oh, it's been disrupted. It has been disrupted. But many of those people who are working in that streaming space came out of there too, right? They know where to get that money. They are white men too. Um, and so I just say that to say, I need us to to think about it um, historically and not to make it over, you know, uh, historicized or theor- theoretical. But when we are saying we really want all of these things from Hollywood, I'm like, do you really want all of these things from Hollywood? Because you do know there's going to be a cost. You know that. Well, you I do know a, that. A good example of going outside the system is mm-hmm. Spike Lee and do the right thing. I know mm-hmm. Malcolm X. Malcolm mm-hmm. X was it's too long that the studio told him it was too long. We're not going to keep investing in this. He went to black people who have money and said, "Cut me a check," and they cut checks. That's mm-hmm. what that's going. That's what going outside the system looks like. It's going to the people who have money and asking them to invest in this story, our story, right? And because, then going to see those films too. Right, and then supporting those films. And they, you know, they say that first weekend is really important, right? That first weekend that a film is out in the, in the theater is really important. So we have to go out that first weekend and support those films. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes those films are questionable, but it's like, we need to support these films because white films are on the entire spectrum. They can be trash and then they can be Oscar worthy and then they have everything in between. For some reason, we only have this side of the spectrum. We have to be Oscar worthy in order to keep working. If you fail as a black woman filmmaker one time, that's it. You don't get another chance, but you have other people who can fail multiple times and they'll still get more chances. So it's, you know, it's complex and you try to figure out, you know, how do you get money to make a film about our people? Do you go to our people and say, can you help me? Can you help Mm -hmm. me tell this story? And that's just, that's where we have to start off. But we also know the gatekeepers are white men predominantly, and we have to figure out how to play within their system. <clears throat> and that's the two truth. Movies, two movies that we should be watching right now based on the uprising that has happened. Two movies from each of you. Uh, let's start with uh, Dr. Uh, Burton. Uh, Good Trouble, of course. Um, you know, with John Lewis. Um, you know, just really looking at, and if you haven't seen it, you should, and you can watch it quite easily. Just say Good Trouble and you can watch it like 12 different places <laughs> right now. Uh, but it's a documentary, Don Porter. 
who is a fantastic filmmaker, uh, documentarian, and most of her films um, look at issues like the criminal justice system, Gideon's Army, things of that nature. A black woman filmmaker um, really gives him, you know, uh, his farewell and an opportunity to not only see, um, you know, his up- upbringing, um, but also how he became the man um, and the young man that he was. Um, so I think when um, we think about protests and march marches and sacrifice, and especially as we're coming up on this election and people are still talking about they can't vote for the for Biden, which is another story, another show. Um, I think it's important to hear from John John Lewis himself. Um, you know, this is a man who's facing uh, his mortality, and he still thinks the most important thing for people to do is to vote, like the most important thing. And so I think people need to see why that is. Another one of my favorite films um, is an international film called Lahaine Hate. Um, came out in 1997, um, and it is a French film, um, but it looks at the uprisings and um, the banlieues, which is the suburbs of uh, Paris. Um, and uh, it looks at the relationship between a Jewish boy, um, an African boy and an uh, Algerian, you know, Algerian in Africa, but that's another story, um, an Algerian um, and their friendship because they all live in a ghetto, they're all in the hood. And what happens when um, or a friend of theirs is murdered during a protest um, and then dies, um, you know, dies later and the uprisings that happen after that. So it gives you, I think, the global context of what uh, protest looks like. Um, I think it also um, shows you the similarities and commonalities that disenfranchised groups have um, across the globe, um, particularly when you're dealing with colonial powers um, who have their foot on our necks, literally, um, and still to this day. Um, and um, that we're not in this alone. You know, it feels like in America with Black Americans, um, we feel like we're in this alone. You know, that we all we got. Like you got your own t-shirts, it's on cups, <laughs> mugs. Uh, we all we got. Um, but we actually got people elsewhere. Um, and so I think this film not only um, does a great job of that, but also shows you uh, hip hop culture um, outside of the US, um, which is still um, very much protest music. Um, my two films would be, um, one would be The Battle of Algiers, which is a black and white film, which um, presents itself as a narrative, but it's a, a, as a documentary, but it's a narrative. And it's about, you know, the, the um, uprising of Algerians in, fr and, in France. And then it's about colonialism and imperialism. And it's also a model that a lot of black organizations use. The Black Panthers and all these other organizations looked at guerrilla warfare in this film and decided this is how it is, this is how it's done. And it's a, I think it, it was one of the first films I ever saw that um, like Nzinga says, it talks about what happens outside of America if you're black. You know, what happens in other countries? Because I didn't know, I just knew about being black in America, but I see what it looks like to be Algerian and not necessarily, you know, dark skin, but to be non-white, right? To be a person of color, to be from an African nation. And then in, the, in Lahaine, you have an Algerian and all these other kids who are treated the way they are because of this imperialistic history, because of colonialism. It just feeds into this film. And I think it's it's just a wonderful film to show. Sometimes it is about the the actual fighting, the actual getting out there and fighting. Not, I mean, we talk about nonviolence, you know, and it's important, but it's also people are being brutalized in the streets, literally, by police officers. Literally, people are going blind because they are being shot in the face with rubber bullets. You know, you have to fight back. And sometimes that literally means fighting back. And I think Battle of Algiers is a great example of that. Um, the other film would be The Spook Who Sat by the Door. Nzinga could say what year, I can't think of what year it was, but it's about a man who is- 1973. 73. So it's about this black man who decides he's gonna join the CIA. He's one of the first, I think the, the first black agent. And he plays the role of the good Negro. You know, he does everything they want him to do. And he's articulate, he dresses well, he plays that role. He learns their skills in order to take it back to the hood and turn this disorganized group of gangs into a militia. And they learn what the warfare looks like from the CIA, from the system. And then they go out and they affect change and they fight back. 
one of the best riot scenes I've ever seen on film is in that film. Cosine. One of the best ways to, show, <laughs> to just show what it looks like in the middle of this chaos, in the middle of fighting back, and you have black officers who are confused about what's happening. It's like, brother, are you black first or are you a police officer first? So there's this conflict that's happening. And I just think it's, it's one of the, if you've not seen it, it's on YouTube. You can find it. And it's just a wonderful film. And I'm going to throw the right thing in there too. And can I add, Ivan Dixon is directed by Ivan Dixon, which is very important. Um, and is based on a book um, that was written by Sam Greenlee, um, which is also very important. So it's based on black literature uh, and made by Ivan Dixon, who was a very successful actor. Most people remember him as the black guy in Hogan's Hero, but he also did nothing but a band. He uh, made, um, uh, which was with uh, Abby Lincoln and um, some other films that he also was a co-founder of the Negro um, Actors Ensemble. Um, theater ensemble. So when you think about a man who's at the height of his popularity in terms of his career, he was also in Car Wash, which I love, um, the original. Um, but when you think about a man who's at the height of his career and in Hollywood and is doing well as an actor um, and operating on that level, and he makes this film in 1973 out of all the films he could make, I think it shows you the choices that Black people make. A lot of times we assume that they don't know or that they're doing, uh, or, or that they're, you know, dupes, but that uh, the choice that he made out of all the films that he could make, he made this one, and it was brilliant. <laughs> Long pause. Yeah. The smile. It, it was the smile in his anger. You're hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> he does it. I see how she gives it. So I, I, I love it. Um, still want some KPIs. Um, I hear you as it relates to asking um, colonists and, and profiteers and exploiters, um, but we have to set some numbers up. Even uh, you know, digitally on our own wallets. Like I'm not, I'm not against you, um, but I think we do have to come together as it relates to just openly supporting things. Like be a little bit more conscious about: Am I going to support that movie because not? Uh, and then really putting some numbers out there. So mm -hmm. I don't know that we can, I know we have to have our own. That's period. Point. We're rolling out, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I love the fact that we are definitely there. I mean, I get it. Uh, you know, pivoting from print to obviously uh, digital and now you got to figure out broadcast and some type of streaming and still be owned by yourself and not talking to VC and, and not being the um, child in the room. So they offer you a little bit of money and you're supposed to tap dance and jump <laughs> hoops and they hold up. And, you know, you're like, that didn't change my life, you know, like, no. So, yeah, I love it. I love the uh, uh, conversation. I think that it's important. Uh, doctor, it was wonderful to meet you. Um, Thank you. Nice to meet you, too. Professor Rogers, uh, I'm, you know, just go ahead and cast me tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> Show me your profile. I, I like, totally missed it, brother. I totally missed it. I, like, I, know, I, know, I know your good side. I know your good side now. Yeah. I'm there. there and if, well, if so, I was. I know. <laughs> I got you. I got you. <laughs> So you're I, good, Dave. You're I good. A list. I, I, my only ask would be every now and then, I think you've got to write what you think in a voice that we uh, can share and, and even just the conversations between two of you, kind of like the top 10 protest. Uh, uh, I think it would be great to be able to do that. Uh, I remember when rolling out probably 15 years ago, I was rolling and uh, I had a little film uh, and it was the spook and Sam and I hung out. Oh, very and cool. then we became friends because I had a, I've had a place. I have a place in Chicago now. Uh, and Sam and I was just hanging out and listening to him. And, and uh, he was a different kind of black man when you, when you think about black men. And so you, I know we're still making some like that, but I'm not certain that they have the same juice that, uh, he had about being black. I mean, it's just a, a different age, different moment, but he was a beautiful uh, guy to just kind of get to know. And 
hang out with him. I think I got with him until his death. So uh, we had some good times and some good insights on, on life and his ideas and, and the pain of being a black man, even of his uh, era generation, which I think is kind of absent um, of most of things. Uh, so I want to thank you both for coming. Uh, last, 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 last ask, and then just take a few minutes. Um, how should we look at films nowadays? If you could just give us an idea of how we, Dr. Burden, really should approach looking at films. Like, I want Black people to know how. You gave us three from uh, Stuart Hall. I want to say that was the guy's name. Yeah, yeah. I'm mm -hmm. slow on taking tests, but uh, <laughs> um, But how should we really begin to look at our films? Because we need to sharpen our eyes. And when people are at a seat at the table, I want them to go away full of information and insight and, and some idea of, how they can approach the table uh, in a different way based on your vision. Yeah, I mean, I think people should um, look at who's making the film. That's number one. So who are, are the players, like the directors, the writers, the producers, um, and things of that nature. Um, I think also um, people should look at the narrative. Is it character driven? Is it plot driven? Um, you know, what is the driving force behind um, this particular story that they're trying to tell or this filmmaker like De Anza, who makes fantastic films, by the way. Um, but uh, that, De, you know, that this particular filmmaker is trying to tell and why. Um, I think people also need to be looking at the socioeconomic um, conditions in which the films were made. So, for instance, our um, films that are made now, they are, you know, um, coming up in this era of the pandemic era, uh, or coming up, uh, coming out of this era of um, protest, social, uh, so, social, pro, uh, social justice protest, um, and coming up in um, this kind of era of uh, really white nationalism and supremacy um, that has always been in this country, but it's just really um, uh, present. But really, look at the socioeconomics, right? The social factors that are happening um, in society at the time that a movie is made. Um, and then how does that play into the time period of the film, right? So we're not talking about, we say time, we're talking, you know, running time is like two hours. No, but we're talking about um, the time period. Is the film set in 1956 in Chicago? Is the film set in, uh, you know, uh, 1830 uh, in France? Where is it set and why is it set? And how does the time period in which a film is made, even if it's contemporary, um, um, uh, impact uh, the story that is being told. And then also, of course, location. You know, if I taught the class, it'd be like narrative narrative elements and stylistic elements. You want to look at all of those different things, right? So whether it's the style, um, the camera angles, the editing, all of that, or whether it's the characters, you know, um, who's the lead and uh, what are their behavioral and physical characteristics and things of that nature. So when people are looking at films, they have to go beyond. I mean, entertainment is great. I can watch stuff and just be entertained and know that it's a horrible trash film. I'll, and I might even love it. Um, but that, is, that has value because sometimes you just need to escape. Um, but ultimately you want to be looking at why a film is made, what is it trying to do and how um, it will shape or influence uh, the next generation of filmmakers and audiences, you know? Um, pay attention to how audiences respond um, to movies too. You know, when you watch it by yourself alone versus when you watch it in a movie theater. Um, but see films more than once, you know, as you get older, as you age, and I'm sure you all can attest to this, you'll, you will watch the movie, yes, months and you too, yes, yes, yes. You will have been watching the movie um, your whole life and then you'll see it and you'll see something completely different that you never saw before. That's because you're changing too. You're changing too. So that's what I would say. Dane, you got anything? Well, you said it all. Um, <laughs> but I would say that critical lens, right? There's a, mm -hmm. a concept called critical media literacy, right? Where you look at the, every piece of media that you're looking at with a critical lens. And you just, it's not about just, oh, so and so is in a movie and it looks pretty, I'm gonna see it. But what's mm -hmm. happening in this film? Uh, I was in a conference online and this uh, white gentleman um, mentioned the skit in Key and Pill, where the teacher is mispronouncing all the names. He's, you know, the black guy and the white kids in the wow. audience. And they're like, yeah, you get the, you get a sense of who this guy is and it's funny. I'm like, if you're a black kid, there's a different layer in that that you understand. As a white person, you think it's funny, but as that black kid named Dayanza, oh. really? Dahatsu? Yeah. Da what? Like, 
Right. To me, it's that 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 you know culture you bring to what you're watching, and that's really important to think about. It's not just there's a visceral feeling, but why do I feel this way? Yeah, there's that critical lens that has to help you understand why you're feeling the way you're feeling, what mm -hmm. you're making at this time period. Like Ms. Zinga said, I'm teaching a narrative one class um, this fall, starts in three weeks, and part of that class is my students are going to have to create around what's been happening in the last seven months. You have to create for what's going on in the world. I don't want your film to be about me and my dad don't get along. I don't care. If, <laughs> unless it's about race, unless y'all dealing with some race issues in that conversation, we don't need to hear about it. We need to hear what's happening. You could talk about the pandemic or you could talk about race or you could put those two things together and you could talk about disparity that the pandemic has shown us. So it's about that critical lens in creating as well as viewing. Cultural competency day. That's what you were talking about. I love it. <laughs> in film. That's, yes. You know, that, that's a whole uh, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion conversation uh, for certain. Well, I want to thank you ladies for coming on. It's been great. We have to do it again. Thank you for having us. <coughs> Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> then you gonna have to cut. No, I've him already, him. I've already put him down. Get his info, girl. Get his info, please. <laughs> I already put it down. <laughs> I've already started doing the, the cast list, and his name is at the top. What are you talking about? Oh, very good. I'm good with lines. I'm, I'm definitely taking my classes, so I'm waiting for the call. Uh, really appreciate. <laughs> Uh, but anytime you want to do some op-eds or put it on rolling out, you know we have RIDE, Rolling Out Innovation Digital Entertainment Conference coming. So, Phil, um, it's going to be virtual this year. I don't know if you've come, but uh, we've had some acting classes. We've actually had some theories. Matter of fact, John Singleton was the, one of the first uh, guys who came, and, and uh, Laz Alonzo and a couple other people actually taught some classes. Um, nice acting classes and did a whole script. But um, I'd love to make sure you guys come through and add a, a, a new lens to it so that we can kind of get some practical uh, um, conversation about all that deep stuff that y'all gave. And I'm gonna have to Google Stuart Hall and I've got a few uh, movies. I'm not the biggest movie buff. Uh, given you love all of the ones we told you about. You love them. I, no, it's it's not that I, you know. I just um, I just finished uh, a women's meditation coloring book. Awesome! Very good. That's Very so good. Bravo! You get a hand. You get a hand clap for that. Yes. Thank you. That that goes out in in September. Um, you know, launching blackbookstore.com. So it's in beta right now. So I kind of got my hands full. A little, a little bit, a little yes, bit. A lot, on, a lot. On, on top of managing, uh, uh, rolling out, growing up, and uh, getting more broadcasts and getting more film and trying to figure out what rolling out film looks like and all of our young people. So, you know, and then introducing them to the geniuses that are actually invisible. Because uh, I have a theory on that too. I think black intellectual power is very uh, invisible in our country. It is in totally underappreciated. So hopefully we can give light to that. And uh, that's why the seat at the table is important. So thank you so much for coming. And I, I'll you. be in touch. And we really appreciate you sharing your love and your knowledge for our culture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Kev, what's going on? Hey, you know, love you. Live to give, brother. Just live to give. Yeah, 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 yeah. What movies are you watching, Kim? Um, I'm watching everything because I was, you know, I was semi-retired for a year. <laughs> <laughs> I got bored. I had to get back into the workforce, but uh, so I didn't watch them all, man. Um, but I'm definitely gonna go and rewatch the Spook Who Sat by the Door. Yeah, I, I was, remember. Yeah, he was a uh, genius writer. I mean, he. he uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm definitely going to check out the body of work by the yeah. brother, the director, Ian, that they mentioned. But um, I, I got something crazy getting ready, getting ready to announce next week with The Rock. 
And, you know, Rock has 190 million Twitter followers, one of the largest social media presence in the world. Next week on our show, we're going to make a big announcement. Ooh. So I'm, I'm teasing that right now. Teasing <laughs> that. Oh, thank you for hanging out, uh, Kev. You always come with it. Uh, we appreciate all of you who are tuning in. Thanks to our producer, Tigner. Uh, for all of you out there, seat at the table, it's important. Share it with your friends. Share it. Share it again. Uh, these ladies really told the truth and gave us insight into this industry and professional courage and intellectual insight. I'm Munson Steve. That's Kevin Hooks. And we are a seat at the table. Good evening, everybody. You do not have to be in the streets, but you do have to be in the struggle.